the last but not least presentation is by Marco Schmidt. Uh, most of uh, people in our lands live in the cities. So we've, we've seen examples of how a countryside can be restored. Mr. Schmidt's uh, presentation is about what can be done in the cities uh, where most of uh, the civilized population now live. And I think more and more people will be coming to the cities. So Marco. Floor is yours. To be here uh, because it's quite difficult. So, we are not so many people uh, with a different view on this aspect of climate. It's so important to have a community uh, around us, otherwise, you drive crazy. Um, and so, I'm working in uh, Berlin already quite a long period on the aspect of ecological construction. I'm more working in urban areas. Um, more than 50% of our population worldwide is living now in urban areas, and I try now to show that there are lots of measures available um, how to improve the whole uh, environmental situation. That means water, soils, climate, as well as food uh, production. And uh, I'm a member of the so-called group um, uh, a water G. I'm working currently in two projects. One project is a, uh, uh, the biggest energy uh, um, uh, optimized construction projects we have from finance from the German Ministry of Economics. Uh, I am mainly responsible for hospitals, so for really complex buildings. And the second project I'm working in is on uh, rainwater infrastructure, so concepts for urban rainwater management. This website, unfortunately, is just available in German. Um, the um, working group WaterG I'm involved in um, has one main aspect. It's a phase change of water from water to water vapor. Uh, it's 700 kilowatt hours per cubic meters. Jan already announced it by liter, so 0 0.7 per liter, 700 per cubic meter. And this is the largest energy shift you have as an element worldwide always evaporation and condensation of water. And you can use it. It's uh, mainly responsible for the global climate, but as, as well you can use it, for example, to cool buildings or to heat buildings on a really efficient way. So you can even heat buildings. If you just compare the 700 kilowatt hours per cubic meter to what you can store in water, water as well is the best uh, sensible heat storage, then it's just 70 if you heat it from 30 to 90 degree. So it's 10 times more. That's how if you start to cook noodles, for example, you have to um, heat up and if you forget it on the, on the fire, it takes 10 times more if you invest the same amount of energy until the whole water disappears. Yeah? So 10 times more. Um, and on the global scale, I, it's the same, I would say, what uh, Trendbert and Kiel published, but I just try to focus now on what is going on on one square meter worldwide. This is one mean square meter worldwide, the energy budget uh, during one day. So you get an incoming solar radiation of 4.5 kilowatt hours. Uh, per day. You convert it to reflection of uh, less than 10 percent, so 300 watt. Yeah, on the right side, do we have a laser pointer? No. Oh, there is one. Yes. This reflection and a certain amount will be converted to long wave emissions. Uh, but most important is always the net radiation, and the net radiation can be converted into sensible heat or evaporative cooling, evaporation of water. So it's the biggest, biggest amount worldwide, So uh, if you focus on that. So this is one mean square meter worldwide. If we now look what is happening in urban areas, because all the rainwater disappears into sewer systems, there's no vegetation available anymore, there's no way out that you convert all the incoming solar radiation into increased term radiation or into sensible heat. These are my own measurements. Yeah, On a, a roof at our culture center, it's an asphalt roof, just as an example for urban radiation and energy budget changes. And we call it the urban heat island effect. And if we are looking now worldwide, what is happening worldwide, we are losing 800 square kilometers every day uh, of vegetation. 800 square kilometers. Yeah, that's uh, about the size of Berlin. I don't know, the size of Bratislava, what, uh, maybe 10% of Berlin or 
a little bit more, yeah, so 80. So it's 10 times the size of Bratislava you lose every day in vegetation. Yeah, uh, urbanization is uh, relevant, yeah, with 150 square kilometers every day. But the uh, most what we are really concerned about is the loss in uh, forest at the moment worldwide. So that means that we convert every day this energy budget into that one by 800 square kilometers. And therefore it's clear that this is the main cause for local climate change and global warming, in my opinion. I come uh, to the conclusions a little bit later. And we note, I love this graph, the large and the small water cycle. We, of course, if you don't evaporate water anymore, you get no precipitation. I would say this is quite clear, quite obvious. Last week I was in Brazil. They are running out of water uh, and they have a huge deforestation rate in the Amazon. And at the moment they are burning down as well uh, uh, the uh, areas around Rio de Janeiro because they are afraid of uh, snakes sometimes. It's a dramatic uh, a change in land use uh, uh, at the moment going on in Brazil. And this has an influence, of course, of the precipitation rates. And a few months ago, the Fietze uh, uh, boss of the big water supplier of Sao Paulo, 20 million inhabitants in Sao Paulo, just recommended, please leave our city because we are not able to supply you in the near future time with water. Yeah, this is amazing what uh, a boss of a water supplier is announcing to the uh, public. And this, uh, just to compare, is now the energy budget as one of our measures, which are really easy to take place, of a green roof with just 8 centimeters of soil. With 8 centimeters of soil, you already convert two-thirds of the incoming uh, uh, net radiation into the evaporation of water, just during the evapotranspiration process. It's just directly in the neighborhood of this roof. Yeah, So this is the same incoming solar radiation yeah, of, uh, in the summer months, a certain amount of reflection, but two-thirds is converted already into the evaporation of water. And these are surface temperatures, so to fight uh, uh, climate change or the urban heat island effect, it's quite obvious that we reduce the surface temperatures. This is a surface temperature of a black asphalt roof, and this is an infrared surface temperature of the vegetated green roof, and this is the uh, temperature of the ceiling of the uh, green roof. Um, this is the ceiling of a black roof, yeah? This is a difference between day and night of 50 degrees. And uh, the ceiling below the soil, because of evapotranspiration and a certain heat capacity, is just 10 degrees between day and night. That means if you want to save energy for cooling inside of the building, just green the roof, yeah? And uh, the durability of this roof is much higher because it's not infected with... Uh, um, solar radiation, so ultraviolet. This roof you have to repair every 20 years yeah, because you receive a leakage. Uh, we have roofs uh, which uh, are, uh, have been created about 100 years ago and they are still intact. And therefore it makes sense to combine two measures of sustainable construction, just producing photo, uh, solar uh, uh, um, energy. Uh, here in this uh, topic it's uh, photovoltaic systems which produce electricity and they are uh, interacting with the green roof because if you cool a photovoltaic panel you will receive more electricity. Yeah? So it's a benefit between both systems and on the other hand you increase the biodiversity because you produce shadow in some places. Yeah? So you get more plants, more species on top of these roofs. And there's even uh, for construction a benefit because uh, the whole load for the photovoltaic panels can be carried with a net below the substrate um, for the photovoltaic panels. It's really interesting. So you don't need to drill holes inside of your roof uh, um, because this uh, is causing uh, infiltration and penetration of water later on. 
So it's a quite easy technology. This is just a sketch for Ufa Fabrik. We harvest the rainwater from the roofs and from the parking places. Uh, we harvest it in a former waterworks station in the underground, 250 cubic meters of tank size. And uh, we clean the rainwater in a small constructed wetland with 25 uh, uh, square meters outside of the building. Uh, because we harvest even rainwater from the streets, so with uh, dog shit inside, um, we need a certain uh, cleaning capacity if you want to supply the toilets. But we have no uh, problem with any uh, water quality if you flush the toilets, for example, uh, with rainwater instead of using tap water. Uh, because the problem we took on lots of measurements is always the user before yeah, he's producing much more pollutants and uh, there's no difference in rainwater or tap water when you use it inside of buildings. Just close always uh, uh, the, what's called, uh, close your toilet if you flush it. This is important, yeah. Yes. Um, another project financed by our Berlin Ministry. It was, um, I would say, the history was quite interesting because we were in Berlin surrounded with a wall. So therefore, all these aspects of uh, uh, urban ecology of Professor Zukorp and you, we started to work on these aspects because West Berlin had to self-supply itself with electricity, with water and so on, and these aspects of urban uh, uh, ecology came up quite early. Um, I just stepped in this topic later, um, in uh, mid-80s, when I started to study landscape architecture. Um, so we still have an infrastructure in Berlin about uh, the aspect of uh, uh, ecological construction, so uh, we have a small department in our uh, city administration in our Berlin Senate of Ecological Construction and they finance the evaluation of innovative projects. This is the Institute of Physics of the Humboldt University, so a different university, it's not mine. Uh, there we have the rainwater from the non-green roofs uh, and we irrigate 500 uh, climbing plants in front of the building. In, uh, they're growing out of 150 planter boxes. For example, we have some planter boxes with terra preta, so we test different types of soil, different types of irrigation, and we're using the rainwater in eight air conditioners for evaporative exhaust air cooling. This is just a view, quite interesting, of the primary energy demand of the building. Uh, this is um, the demand when you calculate it with simulation programs. That's why I'm a little bit against simulation programs, because what you find out in real, if you measure the energy consumption of the building, it's a huge difference, especially for cooling. So this is the estimation for cooling, and the real consumption for cooling is eight times higher. So you absolutely underestimate the energy consumption for cooling. Normally you don't know it. Yeah, I think uh, this building is artificially cooled as well. Uh, you have no measurement inside, no equipment. So that's our main task from university, that first of all, we start to measure where is the energy going to, where it's used for. And um, this is an um, interesting uh, global development. Um, our goal by our ministry was, okay, let's reduce the energy consumption in buildings by 50% until the year 2020. Yeah? We want to reduce the energy consumption. Um, I would say it's uh, an important goal in my view. I'm a fan of renewable energy as well. I'm not a climate skeptic, but um, the main reason, the main argument why we are reducing it are at the moment the uh, climate meetings. Yeah? But there's of course always a second aspect um, because we are absolutely dependent on importing artificial energy. Of course, we have coal, but we are importing oil and so on, and gas, natural gas. We want to reduce our dependency. What is uh, happening, what is the forecast is, we want to reduce the energy consumption by 50%, but we will get an increase by 260% in the same period. So we have a conflict in goals. Um, the main reason is we are using more and more glass in front of the buildings. We decrease the heat capacity because we insulate more. 
we have an increase in electricity consumption inside of buildings. Our equipment gets more effective, but it's getting bigger, like our television sets. And uh, we have an increase in the urban heat island effect and global warming. So, Never use electricity to cool a building, because if you use electricity, you produce the opposite effect. What you intend, you produce heat. If you want to pump out, for example, 680 kilowatt hours of heat out of the building, you will release about 990 kilowatt hours of heat inside of the streets. So it's a conflict. So never use electricity. Instead, uh, evaporate water. It's a quite easy explanation. Here we um, irrigate climbing plants in front of the building envelope. Uh, these are the used spaces. So all in all, we have now 950 climbing plants, which uh, we test for the different orientations and the different floors. And we, um, I developed the irrigation system because we started with these ideas already in the 80s. Yeah, just now, about uh, 25 years later, we start with uh, urban farming and it became a little bit more fashion now uh, to restart these systems. Um, these are now the uh, measurements, the real effects of evapotranspiration of a plant growing in front of a building. These are real measurements, so no simulations. Yeah? I already told you I'm a little bit against these simulations. You need to measure it, yeah? because we have an exact irrigation system, so the plants have a direct access on a water level, and this is controlled every minute by a computer system. So we produce in front of the building per green facade uh, um, um, cooling rate of 280 kilowatt hours per day. <coughs> and we measure as well then the incoming solar radiation and the effect on the energy consumption of the building. And this is now interesting. So we, I made some simulations. Yeah? So these are simulations for if the building would have no sun blinds outside. This is the energy consumption with sun blinds. Uh, which you can control uh, uh, manually. This is the result of the energy consumption with sun blinds, which are controlled automatically. So every day, so if the sun is coming up, you can close it. Yeah? Important is that you reduce the amount of cooling uh, in front of the uh, offices here. Um, these are now the real measurements of our conventional sun blind system. And it's quite interesting. In this case, it fits. Yeah, it fits perfect. So this is the uh, estimation and this is the real uh, uh, estimated consumption. It's the estimated consumption because we measure the incoming radiation. Interesting is if you compare then now the conventional sun blinds to the green facade, just throw away the conventional sun blinds and exchange them to a green plant because then you reduce the cooling amount really dramatically and the whole energy uh, consumption in front of the uh, uh, offices. And it's interesting, it's not only cheaper in operating costs, it's cheaper as well for the sun protection itself. For the Humboldt University you have to invest about 16,000 euros per year in maintenance. If you compare it to the maintenance of the green plants for water, for fertilizer and for maintenance, it's less than 10%. We recommend it that uh, here they sh need to invest a little bit more, yeah, because it up to now it's really poor. Yeah, the first thing facility managers do if they want to save money, they don't invest anymore in the green infrastructure outside. It's completely wrong, yeah, because they pay always uh, like uh, the water and energy bill uh, when they receive it as it's, um, I would say, it's a natural event, like an earthquake, okay, they uh, uh, invest the bill, but they don't realize that if they would invest here a little bit more, they can save here much, much more, yeah. And uh, because the building get, uh, gets overheated behind the conventional sun blind, because the conventional sun blind always have to convert all incoming radiation into sensible heat and into long wave emissions, they had to invest more money in gluing some additional fuel on top here. Yeah? It makes no sense at all. 
And as well, it's much nicer to look outside here than looking outside there because you cannot control it manually. So it just closes and you have no connection uh, what is going on outside of the building. We have an, uh, another aspect. We are using the rainwater in this building uh, in air conditioners, but we don't evaporate water directly into the supply air. First of all, we evaporate the water into the discharge, into the exhaust air from the building. So the air leaving the building with, for example, 26 degrees in the summertime. Then we can cool it down to 16 degrees. And then every building, um, meanwhile, has a uh, heat exchanger. We're using the same heat exchanger which is used in the winter time to recover the heat from the exhaust air. We are using it now in the summer time and we can use external air from 30, 32 degrees, cross exchange it with the exhaust air of 16 degree and supply the building with 18 to 20 degrees of cold air without using any artificial energy. And um, the effect is so positive that we can save about 90% uh, of the energy uh, during a year for cooling. Um, this is a backup system because these uh, buildings like hospitals or laboratory buildings, they have always a backup because you need uh, a certain, you have a certain demand in a laboratory or in a hospital. Um, here we switch on the system and this was the worst case in the last years of uh, outside air temperatures of 38 degrees. Yeah, 38 degrees here on top. Then we switch on the system and here we can save about 70% of the artificial cold. And um, so that means if you have, for example, 30 degrees outside air temperature, you don't need any artificial cold at all that we save about, we estimate about 90%. And now look at the operating cost for this system compared to conventional cooling facilities. <clears throat> if you want to evaporate one cubic meter, you produce evaporative cooling of 700 kilowatt hours. And this, this costs, if you want to pump one cubic meter, about 0.4 kilowatt hours. Um, if you need to pump it, for example, five times, then you spend for a cooling of 700 kilowatt hours about one euro. If you use a dire, uh, electricity directly to cool the building, you have to spend 90 euro for the same cooling rate. Yeah? It's calculated for about 18 cents per uh, kilowatt hour and you have a certain coefficient of performance. Um, it's promised for these equipment, this was, is a train uh, system, so one of the big suppliers of uh, compression cooled systems with uh, 3.7 and we measured 2.05. This is quite typically. Yeah? They are not uh, running uh, properly as promised. Yeah? So you have to invest about 90 euros. Um, we have as well uh, absorption chillers in this building. An absorption chiller, for example, combined with a cool generation, is producing cold water out of hot water. Um, the operating costs are 160 euros for the same amount of uh, electricity or energy. And uh, this is dramatically. It was in the beginning quite a good idea. In the summertime, we call it solar cooling sometimes. Let's produce cold water out of hot water. Yeah, but if you look at the operating cost, you need additionally electricity as a, a, a supply to pump water, about 60 uh, euros for electricity. And you need much, much more water as well for the recooling process of the whole systems, as if you would use the water directly uh, to cool the building system. And we use the cooled water to cool uh, computer systems directly. And in the winter time, we are using the exhaust heat in the system uh, to heat the building. This makes sense. Yeah? It's really interesting and uh, the operating costs are the same. They are really cheap. Um, I have another, because I have to hurry, Potsdamer Platz, Berlin City Center. This was my largest rainwater management project in the past. So I'm coming more from landscape architecture and architectural uh, department. Um, uh, the uh, water administration forced uh, the um, op uh, operator, uh, the construction site, not to put more than 1% of the incoming rainwater into the sewer system. 
So finally, they dis disconnect completely because in Germany, in Berlin especially, we have a problem with our combined fuel system. It runs over about uh, 30 times a year. That means you have the, all the toilet shit uh, finally in our surface waters. And in Berlin, we like uh, to swim in our surface waters. I won't recommend it after a heavy rainfall. Um, here we integrated 40,000 square meter of green roofs, 2,500 cubic meters in four tanks. And uh, we put rainwater, we harvest them in an urban lake with 12,000 square meters. Um, we have an overall stormwater retention of 125 millimeters. I have to run through a little bit because I'm running out of time. I need to come to the conclusions concerning global climate change. Just a short view on that. Um, we have a uh, few instruments working on it at the moment. Uh, demand by city water administration, the landscape plan. Uh, we have a, a split in wastewater fees. That is quite interesting. So I recommend it uh, to implement it here in uh, Bratislava or in, uh, in Slovak Republic that you don't pay only for the wastewater you produce out of the tap water consumption that you have to pay for the sealed surface as well. And rainwater is more expensive as uh, wastewater than uh, normal wastewater. Um, I'm working at the moment in this Kuras project where we try to find uh, uh, um, the um, opportunities in urban areas like here. So you can always implement a tank. This is, I'm really glad that uh, the mother of Jana is here. Uh, Jana is coming from Bratislava and she was a student. Um, she wrote the best master thesis in this topic, uh, climate sensitive urban design. Um, it's really a great work. It's uh, published in English and I would recommend that you implement Jana maybe in the near future as well for these topics and read maybe uh, her master thesis first. Um, we always need to increase evaporation via uh, vegetation structures in urban areas. So just infiltration is not enough. Yeah, we need vegetation structures, really important. Yeah, um, because otherwise, um, so in Berlin, uh, our annual precipitation rates are about 80% in our catchment areas. Um, if you now um, put all the rainwater into the ground, you don't increase the uh, evaporation rate. So you always need to combine it with vegetation structures like here in the streets, like a sketch. Or like here, it's a combination of measures of green roofs, photovoltaic plants, infiltration and trees. Or uh, this is just a view of what uh, we can do in urban areas here as well, like Potsdamer Platz, uh, you can uh, recover streams and try to put every um, uh, grey water or uh, wastewater, every drip back into the natural atmosphere. This is important. So try to recycle it in buildings and then irrigate plants um, to uh, close the small water cycle. So every drip is important every square meter. And I'm coming to the conclusions. I still have two, uh, three minutes. We need to learn from the past. If we are looking to urban areas where our culture is coming from here, for example, the Egypts, uh, you will find desert. But they didn't create their high culture in a desert. It was all tropical rainforest. Yeah, it makes no sense that the old cultures uh, uh, came up in the desert. Yeah, like uh, um, uh, Sumer as well. They started with deforestation because they used the wood for construction, for cooking and so on. And finally they ended in a desert because it didn't rain anymore. So uh, you know the ten plaques of Rome, maybe as a view. Yeah, nine of them are related that the landscape in Egypt dried out. Nine of the ten plaques. Morocco as well. Morocco was called the granary of Rome uh, still 2,000 years ago. If you look now there, it's completely desert. Yeah? Because they are making one big mistake. They have one huge treatment plant, 30,000 cubic meters of wastewater arriving there. And then instead of irrigating then the plants around, they are pumping it into the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ocean won't evaporate more water if you pump uh, uh, um, non-salty water inside. Yeah? And as well, interesting, we have uh, an interesting um, example. 
uh, because I'm a scientist, so I always want to compare A with B. Yeah? So a green roof is a non-green roof. Let's compare West Germany with East Germany. And after we harvested here in East Germany, we have uh, lots of uh, huge uh, 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 wheat um, areas from with 20, 50, 100 hectares. We get always heat waves. And now look at the precipitation pattern between East and West. Maybe you remember um, uh, the former borderline, yeah? It's exactly the borderline between East and West. Just compare then the different kind of land use between East and West. Precipitation rates, Germany. <coughs> we are turning the planet into a desert, especially here. This was all tropical rainforest. We are drying out completely. And you're always told that uh, uh, the climate is changing because of carbon emissions. In my view, this is completely wrong. You mix cause and effect. Yeah, you mix cause and effect. We, of course, we have a certain correlation between carbon in the atmosphere and the global temperature. It's a certain correlation. It's not good, I would say, but it's correlating. If you look a little bit closer, what is happening now with the increase of CO2, you will find always an annual cycle. So we have 0.04% of CO2 in the atmosphere, and the opposite in ecology is oxygen. Yeah? 0.04 to 21%. Um, the annual cycle shows really exactly what is re who is responsible for how much of um, a carbon we have in the atmosphere. It's the photosynthesis process. So this is explained with the photosynthesis process, and the mistake which is made at the moment is this is photosynthesis, but the increase is related to emissions. This is absolutely stupid. This is related to the photosynthesis process as well, because we reduce the photosynthesis process every day by 800 square kilometers. If we would have 10% of CO2 in the atmosphere and 10% of oxygen, I would agree, then emissions are relevant, but not in a relation of 0 0.04 to 21. Yeah? We need to think it dynamic. Emissions don't play any role in this aspect. <coughs> and uh, because we are at the moment on the wrong track, we are coming to wrong conclusions. So we support um, 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 to change our heating systems from coal and oil and gas to biomass. In Germany, you get subsidies of about 2,000 euros if you exchange your heating system to biomass. If you're now looking, the biggest uh, producer uh, in Europe is German pellets in the harbor of Wismar and their big ships are coming from Russia and you produce now you, at the moment uh, pellets out of forests coming from Russia and from Bulgaria. That means with public subsidies we burn down the Russian forest to save the climate. This is absolutely stupid. I'm really upset with this policy at the moment. Um, I can recommend two publications. I, would, I love your publication here. That's why we are here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope we can discuss it a little bit more. Um, it's, um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>